My name is Sebastian and in this video I want to give you my reasons and thoughts why you want to code with Quarkus. Why I think Quarkus, this enterprise Java technology, is a very good choice for enterprise projects and why you should have a look at it. So spoiler, the native mode, the ability to go native with Quarkus is not one of uh, these reasons in my list. And well, let's start out. If we have a look at the website Quarkus.io, it has supersonic subatomic Java, and it certainly has some emphasis of, you know, like native, it mentions Graal VM, and it also mentions some resource consumption comparisons of different ways how to run it. But that's not what I want to start it out. Uh, what I want to start out with, I want to start out with the reason, and you probably have seen this if you tried it out, of the great developer experience and specifically the fast turnaround time that Quarkus gives us. Why is this so important? Well, we spend time coding and since coding is such a flow experience, you know, like we do something, we would like to see the results immediately of our work. We would like to see if our code works. And an easy way to try this out is to just run our applications locally and Quarkus ships, ships a very helpful dev mode with the Quarkus Maven or Gradle plugins that emphasizes and facilitates that. So if we have a look at some example project here, so I typically use some sort of coffee shop example. You can find this on GitHub as well, but that's not really the point. The point is that we can start this quite quickly by saying, okay, I would like to run something like Quarkus dev and in this case, I also use some text um, a test exclude pattern that then just makes this uh, well enables this to to test my application easier. And you've probably have seen this if I run something like coffee exclamation mark here in my hello world example, it just well says coffee. And I'm pretty sure you have seen this uh, countless of times in um, a Quarkus demo. If I change this here to just coffee without the exclamation mark, then it very quickly has to change here because it compiles the code in the background and it very quickly restarts our application. So especially, well, if we don't have many dependencies, this happens really, really quickly. But more than that, and you have probably have seen this, it also keeps track of all of the static files. It keeps track of your dependencies in your POM XML. So you can keep this running and it will actually update and download them. And also you have this way of a very nice testing approach. So let's have a look at that. I'm pretty sure you've seen this as well, this continuous testing. So if we basically activate the testing here, then now we see, okay, that my test fails. I have a coffee shop test and an integration test. That was the reason why I included this other um, this other system property. So now my tests, because they check for coffee exclamation mark, they need to be updated as well. And then we already see once it once the file is being saved, it already updates this. So now it's only one test uh, failing. So let's have this uh, the second coffee IT test. Let's change this as well. And then everything is green again. And well, you can run your tests in your IDE as well. But what I want to point out is how well this works with this Quarkus dev plugin that it actually keeps your classes well compiled um, in the background and you very quickly can trigger your tests. So I can run this again and run this again and you're, you hear my keystroke in the background, how quickly this works. And here it even tells you it's just a bunch of milliseconds. So it literally just has to start and run the tests. And also this includes an integration test that connect to the running application already. So that's kind of cool that you say you can take this further and say, I actually include something that goes to local host and already have something like a smoke test. And for local development, and this is pretty cool, and I've um, talked about this uh, before on this channel, and I also always cover this in my workshops that I do, also include this for more sophisticated system tests or acceptance tests. So for example, what I like to build up as well is to have some sort of system press project. And here that is well quite basic. It connects to the application. It could also create some coffee orders or whatever your domain does. But what I do here, I have a system test project that is actually a separate project, but well, that's the point for another video, how to structure uh, this that actually does a similar thing and connect to my running application. And you can run this with Quarkus as well, even if it's not a Quarkus project. I included this in a, a previous video how to do this. But basically, same story, I can include this here and say, well, if I have some system test, I also need to update that and I have very fast feedback. So you see how quickly this works. 
I basically want to get to a local setup where I don't have to wait for anything. <laughs> so I wait initially when I start up my developing session and say, okay, you know, I need to run some systems. Maybe I have some sort of database, some other external system that needs to be integrated. I can do this locally. I can connect to some um, staging or test system, whatever have you. But then while I'm coding, while my hands are on the keyboard, I don't want to wait. And Quarkus really helps for that. So the Quarkus dev mode and there's also remote dev mode. And there are other helpful tips and, and tricks uh, for which you can make Quarkus work that it you know, it doesn't have any waiting time. The turnaround time is extremely low here. Also, it includes a debug mode. So um, per default, it starts up a, a remote debug localhost 5005 port to which you can connect in your IDE and that works as well. So in short, the developer experience here and especially these fast turnaround times, that's really helpful. And if you try it out, you've probably have seen that's really fun to work with. Well, another reason, and that is a quite important one, is the lower resource consumption. So that's definitely important money-wise if you, you know, have to pay for all of this or especially, well, going to your manager and saying, hey, we should have a look at that. This can actually save us a lot of money, and it does, is the lower resource consumption. So I've uh, talked about this also a few times on this channel. So why that is the case, basically, because Quarkus does all of these optimizations at build time. So it does all of the resolution, how your application works internally well already. And then once this starts up, it well already and always will save you a lot of well effort and resources. So if you that is what is shown on the website, compare it to some other stacks, Quarkus will typically consume less resources and also start up faster. So that is not even connected yet with this way that you can go native using GraalVM, um, but it will basically always is beneficial to you. Also, if you run Quarkus in a JVM mode, and I had a more deep dive video on that, whether you should use the native mode or the JVM mode, but the point is it will always be beneficial if you use Quarkus and its build time optimization to give you a lower resource consumption, which in the cloud world traditionally or uh, usually translates to less money being spent on memory and therefore save you money. Connected to that is also the eco-friendliness of this. And this is something I like a lot because, well, from my mind, I'm not a, in my mind, I'm not a big fan of applications that just use too much resources just because they can, right? So we have all very fast machines compared to a few years ago. We have tons of RAM and, you know, why not just write an application that uses gigabyte of RAM, you know? I'm looking at you, Slack or Google Chrome, right? So uh, yeah, well, we can be just because we can, but we shouldn't do this. So if we have a way to run the same functionality in a more resource and eco-friendly way by just consuming less, why not? We should do this. I mean, we are engineers. We should actually, you know, optimize for a way where we can just save things that we don't really need. I know that's always, well, a trade-off of optimization, where to spend our time. And of course, developer time is expensive. But, well, just using such an approach, especially of the build time optimization that Quarkus has, is definitely um, a big point for eco-friendliness. And then, you know, again, we can have the conversation whether you want to go to the native mode or JVM mode. But in any way, this will save you resources and therefore money. And also, well, of course, uh, energy consumption and is better for the environment just by using Quarkus, which I think is a very nice point. Another point that is quite interesting is the Docker support that I would say not necessarily support, but the fact that we have thin deployment artifacts out of the box. What does that mean and why do we care? Well, basically, if you have a look at a project, how it builds your Quarkus application, if we go and just package everything together, it will have an interesting structure in the target directory. Let's go there. That has your runnable application in this Quarkus app directory. That is not just a single jar, but it basically says, well, we have um, this Quarkus run jar that is tiny. So these are it's not even a kilobyte here. And all of the other app uh, dependencies and especially runtime dependencies are basically shipped in some extra directories. So 
you might say, okay, why does this even make sense? Why does it have to be so complicated? Well, it does make a lot of sense if we have a look at how containerized workloads are being built, especially with container image layers. That means if we have something like a Docker file that then results in our project, we are adding these dependencies basically one after another and you should well take care which ones to add because if we typically make changes in our application so you know we write new classes we change functionality and so on that doesn't mean that we have to ship the whole framework and this megabyte of dependencies that we have so with this we can save a lot of build time and transmission time and cost so basically we can say well please build this to some image and i will now just use my own um, docker repository for this i just call this temp it doesn't matter but basically if i build everything together it says well if you've done this before it uses your cache anyway okay so let's build our application one more time and then do the docker build one more time now we see that it does the, use the cache for all of the previous layers and then it actually only adds what has been changed basically so with this we save a lot and the funny thing is once we push that to our repository the first time it will take a long time and just push everything and all of these megabytes and then all the next times when we rebuild our project it basically optimized for only the things that need to be rebuilt and retransmitted that's the same for building that's the same for pushing, for pulling, and all of these actions that we do with our containers. So in this way, if I now push my image again, we save a lot and just a few kilobytes are actually transmitted and this works really, really fast. And that has been included in a lot of enterprise Java runtimes and ways how you know these thin deployment artifacts have been built traditionally. But the way that Quarka supports this out of the box, although it is actually a somewhat jar based way, uh, not somewhat, it is jar based, not a fat jar, but just um, this layered um, jar with, um, with which you can start your application. And that still supports this optimized way of using containers and deploying and shipping that. Another big reason is that Quarkus supports known APIs. So Quarkus traditionally come from this enterprise Java world that used to be called Java EE, Jakarta EE, Microprofile, all of these APIs. That is the basis of Quarkus and I'm pretty sure you know this. So if we have a look at our code, we see of course, well, all of these application scoped dependencies, we can have at inject and things like that. Let's see what I have here. I have, for example, these JaxRS resources. So JaxRS is also um, an API that traditionally comes from Java EE, now Jakarta EE, and so on. So if you have seen these, <laughs> these annotations and have used these specifications, you see, well, this actually is independent um, implementation independent or agnostic. And Quarka supports these. So basically, if you have a team of developers or if you are a developer who knows uh, this, who has used this before, then it's quite straightforward to use Quarkus because you don't have to learn that many new things. So this is really helpful. And well, if you have a look at that list, also with um, it supports Spring with a caveat though. So it supports a lot of Spring annotations. So basically, if you well look at uh, the traditional word of world of uh, Java EE and, and Spring, you see that a lot of concepts are very similar. So it does make sense to say, okay, for migration projects, we could make the case that for these, um, we can have so, sort of a one-to-one -one translation of what is a Spring service or a Spring component or a Spring REST controller to an enterprise Java, well, application scoped bean to a JAX REST controller. So there's very similar um, functionality. And Quarka supports a lot of these annotations. So you basically can say with a very minimal effort, you can actually um, migrate a lot of uh, code that was in a Spring project to be executed or to be run by Quarkus that then helps you to further migrate. For example, this can be helpful if you have a huge project with hundreds of classes and you have no time to, um, well, initially 
make the change to all of these ap application scoped or um, annotation mappings where then you say, okay, I just change a minimal way of configuration, how I run my project so that it's Quarkus by, powered by Quarkus. And um, then I can add some dependencies that support the Spring APIs, the Spring annotations, and that actually works so that you can run, in fact, Spring code with Quarkus. So that's also kind of interesting that this is supported. But anyway, what I find quite helpful is that Quarkus doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. I mean, how many HTTP APIs in Java are out there or many frameworks that uh, all want to be, you know, the, the standard thing how to do how to do things. So I like that, especially the standards are supported and this is very helpful, especially for existing knowledge in this space. And then also besides that, to fill in the gaps um, for, well, what is missing in Jakarta EE and MicroProfile, there are a lot of very helpful Quarkus specific APIs, especially I want to point out Panache and uh, Qt, this templating engine and Panache for persistence. If you're interested in that, let me know in the comments that I can um, do a, a more specific video on this if that helps you. But it's very, very cool APIs that are supported in Quarkus. You can see that the Quarkus developers have really thought this out pretty, pretty well. So when I tried out Quarkus for the first time in 2019, in the beginning, it was already very, very well thought out. It was not just a toy. You could write real world applications with this and you could see, okay, you know, Whoever created these APIs really know what they're doing, what is required in real world projects. And this is pretty cool to see. So uh, this works pretty well. And well, if you have a look at the Quarkus documentation and the guides, uh, they will help you there a lot. And that's also um, an interesting point about the Quarkus ecosystem, the documentation especially, and also the support. So I can tell this firsthand because there are a lot of issues um, that I opened up, um, especially in the beginning um, in the Quarkus repository and all of that is on GitHub, of course. And the support that you get is extremely helpful. Like it's, you know, sometimes it's crazy how fast you get a reply or how fast things are actually being fixed. So, you know, big shout out. Uh, to my friends um, at Red Hat and, well, of course, also other contributors who really make this a great ecosystem. So if you uh, look into that, it's it's actually super cool and helpful and, you know, fun to uh, contribute something. Also, I contributed uh, some code and, you know, it's just a nice ecosystem. So anyway, these are my reasons why you would like to code with Quarkus in year 2023 and onward, why I think it's a very good choice for an enterprise Java technology and why, well, most of my uh, clients at least consider moving to Quarkus or having a look uh, at Quarkus or are already using it. And if you want to learn more, I have some courses uh, for you. So actually, well, I have some on-demand courses or if you like an interactive way of asking questions, we also um, have some workshops that you can attend virtually. So I link all of that in the description below. And I'm also interested in your opinion. So what do you like about Quarkus? What do you think is uh, the best Quarkus reasons or killer features? Or do you like it even? Do you think there are some pieces missing or what you're not that happy about? So I'm really interested in hearing your opinion. And if you found this helpful, I would also really appreciate a like. So thanks a lot for watching and bye.